Thanks to the parachute science of the early 1900s, much is known about some of the first forms of horned dinosaurs. These take the form of some of the most familiar Mongolian faces, Protoceratops and Cetacosaurus. However, in the centuries since these discoveries, many more have been made across Asia to fill in the gaps and stretch back the horned dinosaur evolutionary line to the Jurassic with such fantastically adorable forms as Yinlong. None of these finds explain how these tiny little runners made it into North America and evolved into the largest horned dinosaurs to ever live. One find published in 2014 provides the best picture yet on what was going on with horned dinosaur evolution between Asia and North America. Many of the finds we see published today were made many years ago, sometimes many decades. Science in the US is heavily underfunded and paleontology is one of the most underfunded of the sciences. As a result, not much money is sitting around to hire the amount of help needed to process the sometimes century or more of backlogged fossil finds, let alone those freshly returned from the field. This is why many museums have to rely on slip I mean, shoot, I mean, uh, uh, volunteer help. These volunteers end up doing the majority of the work, being paid in experience. Despite my passive-aggressive misgivings with how things are forced to work, this sort of process does allow for enough time for plenty of researchers who are around to get their behinds to work on stuff that has been forgotten, or simply the rainy day specimens. One such find was collected by paleontologist Scott Madsen in 1997 while he was volunteering as part of a National Geographic funded expedition to Carbon County on the border between Montana and Wyoming helmed by Richard Cefeli. Though this expedition's intention was the small forgotten parts of Mesozoic ecosystems, microfossils, Madsen absolutely had to collect this most important of finds. As he states in an old KSL interview, I at some point was walking along the little terrace and noticed this little bit of white on the side of the rock about the size of a grapefruit, right on the edge of this clip, he said. I picked it up and there was teeth in it, so I knew almost immediately that it was a skull, and it was a pretty rare size. This little skull, designated OMNH34557, was falling out of a layer of rock called the Cloverly Formation, a layer of rock found in Montana, Wyoming, and Colorado, and which dates to between the Valanginian and Cenomenian ages of the early Cretaceous Epoch, 140 to 98 million years ago. This formation has often been divided up into smaller sections by different researchers in different ways. Dino Renaissance grandfather John Ostrom split it up into fourths by number, while R. M. Moberly Jr. split it into thirds by funny little names. I prefer funny little names over boring old dry numbers any day, so let's go with Moberly Jr.'s take. The prior conglomerate is the power bottom with big black pieces of chert throughout. The little sheep member is the middle child and is made up of purplish gray to near white mudstone. And the top in this rocky relationship is the Himes member, which is a bunch of sandstone and mudstones. Our scully OMNH34557 friend came a tumbling from the uppermost layer of the Cloverly, so Unit 7 if going by Mr. Deinonychus, or the tippy top of the Himes member if we want to be quick with it. Now that you have a crystal clear understanding of exactly what little belt of rock the noggin came a knocking from, you need to know what the noggin is missing and what it belonged to. Madsen brought the little noggin back to camp. Once field season was over, Madsen and the field crew packed up all their stuff and shoved every field jacketed rock and fossil into every nook and cranny they could find before hightailing it back to Vernal, Utah so that the poor wage slab, I mean, uh, volunteers could get to the painstaking and free work of removing the field jackets and preparing away all the rock from the fossils that lay within. 
Back before lab preparation began on the fossils collected from the expedition, Madsen and company had confirmed the little noggin belonged to a plant-eating dinosaur. The only one small enough from the area and time was a jumpy little ornithopod called Zephyrosaurus, the mascot of the last page of every alphabetical dinosaur book throughout the 90s and 2000s. Dipping the digital pen back into the well, I bring you another juicy Madsen quote from an ancient KSL article. There was at some point, when I was excavating, where I was starting to see more and more of the little skull appear under the microscope and realize that it wasn't this other animal, Zephyrosaurus, because I had pictures of the other animal in front of me and it was very different, he said. When I got towards the front of the skull and it just kept going and going and going and probing down, I suddenly realized I was looking at a beak and that was really cool. I knew immediately that this was a little ceratopsian dinosaur. Despite all his work on this cute little specimen, it would be turned over to the Oklahoma Museum of Natural History, since they were the ones doing the expedition. The specimens technically belong to them, hence the specimen's ascension number. So, here is the little skull Madsen found. It's only missing some of the back of the head, where the tiny little primitive frill would be, plus some of the miniature bones from underneath and inside the skull. It's also missing a lot from half of the face, but that's thankfully not needed to reconstruct the skull to what it looks like without the two-faced thing going on. This little noggin came packed with a little jaw accessory too, though it's also just a half. Just the tip of this little thing is complete and the whole thing is missing the back part where it would attach to the skull. Once the researchers at the Oklahoma Museum took careful measurements, observations, images, and scans of the bones and compared them to all other known tiny primitive horned dinosaur bones, they were confident this little ankle biter was a new genus and species, which was named Aquilops americanus. In a 2014 paper published in PLOS One by Andrew Fark, W. Desmond Maxwell, Richard Cefelli, and Matthew Waddell, Aquilops means eagle face, while Americanus is American. Before we get ahead of ourselves, let's bring in Mr. Man from Animal Planet's The Most Extreme to get an idea of how large Aquilops was. With everything filled in and reconstructed in the skull and some math is thrown in to estimate a body size based on the skull size and how that compares with the size of all other known primitive horned dinosaurs, this Aquilops has been estimated to have been around 60 centimeters, 23 inches in length and weigh a hefty 1.5 kilograms, 3.3 pounds when it was alive. Was this thing just a baby? Did these crusty creatures really just come pre-packaged this way? Thanks, Mr. Man. Our 2014 nerd crew did some nerd stuff with the bones and found out that this individual Aquilops was a subadult when it died. This conclusion was reached by identification of mostly immature and some mature signs in the skull. Specifically, the thing had disproportionately large eye sockets, smooth bone texture, small size, and weird ridges on the teeth. Aquilops probably wouldn't have grown tremendously larger than this specimen once it reached skeletal maturity since it was getting closer to that when it died. It's thanks to this weird subadult life stage that it proved a tricky varmint to wriggle into an evolutionary tree, but the hardworking paleontologists were able to do the dirty job. The researchers, as every group of researchers in every genus or species paper does, collected all of the anatomical traits of the skull, entered them into a phylogenetic software program, and ran the program against the anatomical traits of a bunch of other known horned dinosaurs. This process usually spits back more than one organization of critters, and the authors usually go with the most stable and parsimonious one. In this case, Aquilops placed all in its lonesome as an early diverging clade of Neoceratopsian Ceratopsian dinosaur, right before the group split off into the combined forces of Auroraceratops and Yamaceratops and a bunch of groups of branches, but also right after Leoceratops did the same thing. This should tell you that there are a whole bunch of steps and branches that led to Aquilops that have yet to be found. Another higgledy-piggledy thing this analysis proves is that Aquilops isn't much related to the later hornless Leptoceratopsidae family that were present in North America, and very distantly related to the true horned dinosaurs of the Ceratopsoidea group, my faves. 
The author team thinks this means that the evolution of the broader Neoceratopsia group was a zigzag carpool between Asia and North America, with animals going back and forth between the two continents throughout the Jurassic and Cretaceous periods, though mostly in the Cretaceous. How do these so-called experts know that these little guys didn't come over into America through the Oibrov way? Well, there aren't any European Ceratopsians. One possible Ceratopsian exists in the form of Ajkaceratops, but it's so fragmentary and bizarre that researchers have gone back and forth as to what it is over the years, including a 2024 study that thinks there is a strong possibility that it isn't a Ceratopsian at all. So, with only Asian and North American options on the evolution menu, the most parsimonious choice here is a land bridge hopping happy meal adventure across Beringia as it rose and sank and rose and sank throughout the Cretaceous period. This would also explain why there is the stupid weirdo Cynoceratops hanging out in China right before the asteroid strikes. So, sweet, now we have this cute little ankle biter. But what do we know of it and what it lived with? Since this silly goober is just a noggin and nothing else, not much can be said about the daft thing. However, its two shining traits are the beak and its horn. You see, the beak hangs down at a sharp angle from the jaw, like an eagle beak. There is also a rough ridge and boss along the outer edge of the beak, which has been taken to represent a pointy spike or ridge in life. I'm personally not so sure there is enough preserved in the skull to realistically expect a super pointy spike sticking directly out of the feeding apparatus, but weird things have happened, and keratin can do all sorts of wondrous things. The missing part of the back of the skull has been inferred from its relatives, which all have basically the same thing going on, with no aesthetically extravagant accoutrements adorning the apparatus. With some skin and keratin stretch over that itty bitty shelf of hypothetical bone, who knows what Aquilops was getting up to. As with the back of the skull, the rest of the animal is assumed to be similar to its relatives. And again, this isn't bat guano crazy because every single one of its relatives were running around atop a pair of thin hind legs while carrying their minute little paws in a neutral pose against the chest with not much to work with when it came to digits. These critters usually had rather tall, skinny neural arches and tail ribs, affectionately termed chevrons, along the tail. What the hell this crest of bone and muscle was for is anyone's guess, as it's not really seen in any other group of dinosaurs, and it goes away when they start developing their horns and frills. Probably some frivolous sex thing like usual. Paleo artist and banging musician in secret, Brian Eng, was tasked to do a bunch of dope art for this publication when it came out, and he added some fun little waddles, keratinous spines, and proto-feathery quill-like things, all of which is nowhere near out of the realm of possibility or probability, considering what is known of these tiny ankle biters. But why be an ankle biter? Maybe they were peaceful fur nippers. Aquilops comes from the top of the Himes member of the Cloverleaf Formation, a layer of rock composed of coarse-grained sandstone and a ton of mudstone. These rocks and the animals they contain would have represented freshwater systems like overbank, lake, and soil-stuffed environments. The area was hot and humid, with forests all over the place cut apart by lakes, streams, rivers, and all that fancy stuff. Living in those water bodies were the usual Cretaceous fare, hybodont sharks, lungfish, bowfins, pycnodont fish, salamanders, sirens, turtles, and a bunch of crocs that don't belong to the living crocodilia. Many of these animals were big enough to take on aqualops or straight up swallow one whole. Next up are the mammals. This layer of rock has produced a bunch of mammal fossils, including those from the saw-bladed multi-tuberculates, the pouch-wearing marsupials, and other weirdos. Many of these mammals would have been slightly too small to pose a serious threat to an adult aquilops, but would have made short work of their children, hence the ankle-biter moniker I cannot get enough of. Aquilops and its kin were like a sentient pair of hedge clippers or bolt cutters running around on lizardy bunny legs. Don't even get me started on the behemoth jaws of life, or death in this case, that are Udanoceratops. 
the thing that tried to steal Aquilops' thunder, Zephyrosaurus, was probably similarly sized to adult Aquilops, but the difference in teeth and beaks tells you they settled their differences and ate different things. Some critters that Little Eagle Face did have to look out for were the giant titanosaurs Rugocaudia and Sauroposeidon. Boy, do I miss the days when that used to be a brachiosaur. The giant-tailed raptor-swatting iguanodont Tenontosaurus was here too. Aquilops needed to watch its step or risk being crushed by the burly silhouette of Tatankacephalus, or just simply picked off by the giant Acrocanthosaurus or the mysterious Ovaraptorosaur Microvenator. In this terrifying world of danger in all corners, I like to think this tiniest of horned dinosaurs would have been an ornery little bastard that delivered nasty nips to anything that even looked in its general direction. With just a noggin to go off of though, that's all I have for you. Only more crumbs will lead to a better chip. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching.